Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, Alex Vesia had a rough outing down in AAA. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to dig into some of your questions about the strike zone we see on TV, Bobby Miller as a potential bullpen option this year, and a few other things. So that's what's on tap. So let's get Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Dodger fans, this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. Or even better, go ahead and subscribe wherever you're watching or listening right now, and then you can be an everydayer just like we are. If this is your first time with us, I am Jeff Snyder. My normal co-host is Vince Samperio, although it's just me today. Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans, just like you are. We've also both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room, so we're not quite insiders, but we bring you the smart fans' perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MLB today to get 10% off your first month. And uh, this is my last recording here from my parents' house. And so starting next week, I will be back to my regular uh, podcasting studio. Uh, I apologize again for yesterday's episode with the staticky audio. I appreciate a lot of you reached out to me, told me you enjoyed the episode anyway, you powered through. Really appreciate that. It does mean a lot to me. Uh, today, I, I think I figured out it was my wireless earbuds that I was using that was causing the static. So today, I am going straight through my uh, my phone's microphone. And so you may get a little bit more background noise than usual, but hopefully the overall audio quality will be better than what we had yesterday. And then we can look forward to next week when we'll be back to my nice, fancy, professional microphone. Uh, but let's jump right in. We do have some questions from you listeners to get to. And uh, But first, I want to talk a little bit about Alex Vesia. As you probably know, Alex Vesia was sent down to the minors when the Dodgers activated or called up Gavin Stone for Wednesday's game. Vince had talked about the likelihood that that would be the corresponding move, and Vesia's appearance on Tuesday night probably solidified that or even made it happen if it wasn't the plan. So they sent him down. He made his first appearance on Thursday night with Oklahoma City, and it did not go well. He came in with a two to one lead. Six batters later, Oklahoma City was down seven to two. Uh, no, six to two. Uh, yeah, Vesia faced six batters, and five of them scored, including uh, his first four batters went double, walk, single, grand slam, and then he got an out and then gave up another home run. Rough outing for Vesia. Uh, obviously, whatever's been wrong with Vesia this year, we didn't necessarily expect it to be magically fixed just by being in AAA. The hope is that whatever magic he is missing from last year and the year before, that he can refine it in AAA. And so while this first outing is discouraging and frustrating, especially for him, I'm sure, uh, I'm not I'm not as worried about it as I thought I was going to be, uh, simply because th- we knew there was work to be done. This confirms there was work to be done. It's a little bit concerning that he had I mean, I think this was worse than he did in any major league game this year. And you would expect him to do a little bit better just by virtue of the competition being lesser. But ultimately, we knew that Alex Vesia had some work to do. And now we know that Alex Vesia has some work to do. Nothing really changes there. Uh, but I, I did want to bring that up because it is important to the major league Dodgers. It, it, it's really nice that the Dodgers do have Victor Gonzalez. He appears to be back or at least currently back. Um, to his 2020 form, and that's good because the Dodgers need that left-handed arm. Caleb Ferguson is pitching well. They also have Justin Brule, who uh, is down in the minors right now. That was more of a roster thing. I think Brule will be back probably at some point, and uh, yeah, they they have some options, but I think hopefully Alex Vesey can get things figured out because I do think the Dodgers' bullpen is better when Vesey is at his best, Uh, and, and so I I like Alex Vesey a lot as a player, as a pitcher, as a person. Uh, And so I am rooting for him to get it figured out in AAA. Does look like he's going to be down there for a little while because there's definitely some work to do and some things to figure out. Uh, But that does bring us to the first question from a listener. We, you know, off day on Thursday. And so 
no game to talk about. And so as we often do, we put out a call for questions. And uh, Thomas, uh, who is on Twitter, I know he has a Twitter handle. He texted me this question directly, so I don't remember his Twitter handle. Sorry, Thomas. Uh, you guys know Thomas. He's on some sort of champagne guapi is, you know, there's underscores or something, but his Twitter handle is something like that. But he asked, could you see a scenario where Bobby Miller gets called up in season and used as a reliever in the postseason? Do you feel like his stuff would play well in that situation? And, you know, Bobby Miller just made his AAA debut a week or so ago, uh, looked good, throwing hard. Uh, honestly, the, the short answer to this question is absolutely. Bobby Miller has great stuff, and it definitely could play up even more in the bullpen. If he came in knowing he's going one inning, uh, he he could be pumping 102 miles an hour out of the bullpen. Uh, he, he could definitely be a very effective weapon out of the bullpen. Uh, or he could be a, a, a longer reliever. He could, you know, because he's throwing 100 miles an hour as a starter. And so even if he knew I'm throwing two or even three innings, he could still be throwing 100 and, and still have that good stuff. Uh, only ne never facing a batter twice in a game is a good way to break into the big leagues. It's not foolproof. I was just talking to my brother the other day about Walker Bueller in 2017 uh, giving up uh, speaking of Alex Vesia's night tonight, Bueller in a game against the Rockies. I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, the way my brain works, I remembered it was also the game that Alex Verdugo hit his first career home run. But Bueller came in and it was might have been two to nothing, two to one. The Dodgers were down, and Bueller, uh, fourth batter he faced, hit a grand slam. So you can guess how the first three went. Uh, and, and you know, Bueller has great stuff too. And you would have thought it would have played up in relief. So it doesn't always work. Uh, and Bueller, that was kind of the thought with him in 2017, was get him up here, get him pitching in relief, and he might be able to help us in the bullpen in the postseason. Ultimately, it didn't work out. He didn't make the postseason roster, and instead they had guys like Brandon McCarthy and other guys who weren't really contributing, and, and it came back to bite them a little bit. Obviously, we know there were extenuating circumstances in that World Series, but it would have been nice to have a fully effective Bueller. And so, you know, maybe one of the things they learned from that experience is to maybe, if that is their plan, maybe do it a little bit sooner uh, to get Miller a little bit more experience in the big leagues. But, you know, a lot of that does come down to how the rest of the bullpen performs over the next few months. You know, trading for another point Thomas made in a follow up text was that trading for relievers is never fun. Uh, and he mentions O'Neill Cruz and Jordan Alvarez, two minor leaguers that the Dodgers traded for relief pitchers. And ultimately, you know, Jordan Alvarez has turned into a superstar in Houston. O'Neill Cruz has turned into a guy, a potential superstar. He's currently hurt, maybe out for the season, definitely out for a long time. But very, very talented. And, you know, the Dodgers got Tony Watson for O'Neill Cruz. They got Josh Fields for Jordan Alvarez. Obviously, two trades they wouldn't mind taking back. But at the time, they need relief pitching. Andrew Friedman, though, has said that he hates trading for relievers. He hasn't mentioned those names specifically, I don't think, but that's what he's saying is it's no fun to trade a good minor league prospect for a reliever who may or may not work out. And relievers are so volatile, so hard to tell if they're going to work out. I don't think the Dodgers want to trade for any bullpen help, uh, at least nothing of, of any value. And so fixing those problems from inter uh, fixing them internally would be ideal, whether that's Alex Vesia figuring things out, Bobby Miller coming up, you know, uh, they, they've got options, uh, especially once, uh, you know, if Pepio gets healthy, he could be a long reliever, uh, you know, Michael Grove. They, they've got so many starters when everybody's healthy that, that some some of those things could happen. But I think the Dodgers are hoping to have a strong bullpen that without the need to go out and trade for anybody at the trade deadline. I think that's the goal. And so Bobby Miller could definitely be a key part of that goal. Miller is long-term, he's a starter. And the Dodgers see him as a starter. His value is as, as a starter. But for this year, it definitely could make sense to have him in relief. Thank you, Thomas, for that question. I've got a few more questions to answer from you guys, so I'm going to come back in a minute and do that. I want to thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. And please keep it Locked On Dodgers. This episode is brought to you by Rocket Money. You know those uh, free trials. Try it free for 30 days. Just give us your credit card number, and then as long as you cancel before you get billed, before the 30 days are up, you don't have to pay for anything. And if you're anything like me, you end up paying for things because you forget to cancel, and you know, out of sight, out of mind. Well, Rocket Money is here to get things back in sight and in mind by letting you 
cancel these things. In, in fact, more importantly, find the things that you're spending money on and then cancel them. Rocket Money will go through your, you, you just link up your credit cards. It goes through and finds, hey, you've got this subscription, this subscription, this subscription. And you can look and say, oh, I didn't know I had that. I don't want to be paying for that. Oh, I remember signing up for that free trial. I've been paying for that for three years. And whatever it is, right there within Rocket Money, there's a little uh, cancel button. You just say, hey, cancel this one for me, please. And Rocket Money says, yes, sir, or ma'am. And it cancels and you don't have to do, it's so easy, it's so convenient, and you can save hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. One more time, rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. All right, I am back. I want to thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. If you're watching on the podcast or on YouTube, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section. If you are uh, listening on the podcast, love to hear from you through social media or you know email or whatever. I'll give you all that contact info at the end, like I always do. I also want to remind you, the Dodgers take on the Padres. Uh, first games against the Padres this year. It's going to be exciting tonight. Uh, down in San Diego. And if you want to catch every pitch of the local Dodgers hometown broadcast with Sirius XM, just pull up the SXM app and search for Dodgers and you can get it there. You can also listen to this podcast on the SXM app simply by searching for Locked on Dodgers. It's a great way to catch your Dodgers, great way to catch this podcast. So check that out. Moving on, uh, we have another question. This one came via text message from our buddy Greg in, in Bartlett, Illinois. Uh, Greg is a, a loyal listener, uh, frequent question asker, frequent commenter, uh, and he is probably our most frequent texter. Uh, that's how we communicate. Love it. Uh, I'll give you the text number at the end too. It's great. It comes straight to my email. Really easy way to communicate with us. And uh, Greg, this one's not specific to the Dodgers, but I thought it was a really interesting question, so I want to talk about it. He says, when we see the strike zone on TV, it appears in two dimensions. But my understanding is that the zone is 3D and that if the ball touches the zone at any point, it's a strike. Does this sometimes create an illusion for TV viewers about strikes that look like balls because they're out of zone, out of the zone when they first cross the plate, but break into the zone as the ball travels through the zone? Or does the TV view somehow account for this? Uh, and this is a great question. And the, the short answer, Greg, is, yeah, it can create that illusion. Uh, but I think it's not a huge deal. And I think it doesn't happen very often. And I'll explain why. Because uh, I, I think, but this is my understanding of the TV strike zones. And, uh, you know, I, I have looked into it quite a bit. I think my understanding is correct. Uh, you know, don't quote me on it. If, if you're uh, on who wants to be a millionaire and the question comes to that, call a better expert than me. But I think this is how it works, is that the, the TV zone is at the front of the plate. And so uh, it's when the ball gets to the plate, where is it? That's what you see show up on the on the zone. And most pitches, it, most of the movement at that point that, that's going, the, the plate is only you know a foot and a half deep. And so when you're talking about 60 feet, six inches, and, or, you know, after the release point, you know, 55 feet, whatever it is that the ball is traveling, and it's got uh, horizontal movement, like a lot of horizontal movement is 20 inches. So if something's moving 20 inches over 55 feet, the actual movement at the end in that last foot and a half is, is pretty negligible. We're talking about an inch or two of horizontal movement. And so if you're looking at a, at a slider uh, and say it's a, you know, a, arm side slider. And so, so the ball is coming towards the plate. It's starting, uh, you know, say it's a right-handed pitcher throwing a slider to a right-handed hitter throwing it uh, or to a left-handed hitter, let's say a backdoor slider. So it's starting in the right-handed batter's batter's box and coming and trying to catch the outside corner of the plate. Yeah. It could be where it's outside when it gets to the front of the plate, but it does snip a little bit of the back of the plate but also you got to remember the plate is not a square. It, it's, it's, what's that word? A, a pentagon, but not a perfect pentagon. You know what home plate shaped like? You're a baseball fan. I don't need to explain that. Sorry. Um, but so 
the actual portion of the plate that it could catch isn't even a full foot and a half. It's like, what, eight inches? And so you're really talking about a tiny bit of movement, horizontal movement that could be happening there. So I don't think we're missing many inside outside strikes because of this phenomenon. I just don't think there are that many pitches that are inside or outside when they get to the front of the plate and then do catch part of the plate in the back. Where it can be more of an issue is on vertical break because vertical break, like I said, 20 inches or so is a lot of horizontal break, but it's not uncommon for a guy with a really good 12-6 curveball to see 50 inches of vertical break, uh, you know, 40 to 60 it, it happens. And so when you've got a curveball that's that sharp, yeah, I mean, you could have six inches of movement, four inches of movement uh, from the front of the plate to the back of the plate. And because the plate does get the full uh, foot and a half in the middle of the plate, you know, there, there's more room for it to catch it. And so you could have, you know, a, a picture a Clayton Kershaw curveball, a hooper duper. Uh, that starts out high and drops down into the zone, you could easily have one of those that when it gets to the plate, it's high, but it does catch the back of the plate. Uh, so, so yeah, th that's a very good point, Greg. I do think it doesn't come up that often just because e even when, when guys throw these curveballs, they're not aiming for the top of the zone very often. Usually, you know, a, a good curveball with a lot of vertical movement they're trying to hit the bottom of the zone. It's not very common that you see uh, a curveball where they start it at the guy's head and try to drop it to the top of the zone. It's just not how pitchers pitch because it's too easy to hang a curveball like that. You know, you you drop it to the top of the zone. Well, if you actually drop it six inches below the top of the zone, it's right at the you know in the sweet spot, and that's what we call a hanging curveball. So pitchers just to avoid hanging curveballs, they don't throw them right there that often. Not that it never happens. Usually when it does, it's on accident. But usually they're starting the pitch at the top of the zone and trying to get it to drop out of the zone or even starting in the middle of the zone and trying to get it drop into the dirt. That's usually the goal on a curveball. And so I, that's the, the longer answer that can be summarized as the pitches that pitchers are most likely to throw aren't likely to fit this category that Greg mentions about pitches that aren't in the strike zone at the front of the plate, but are at the back of the plate. Uh, and so while it's theoretically possible and definitely happens that pitches get mistracked on the TV strike zone, uh, I don't think it happens very often. Uh, and that's by design. Uh, and I do think when they do implement the, the automatic, the ABS automatic balls and strikes, the robo umps, whatever you want to call it, Computers are great, and they will account for all of that. They it will be a three D zone, and and I mean it's it's basic computing. It's it's not hard for them, and so you know you're you're already calculating a, a very a variable height on the strike zone, and it's easy enough to program when you've got a standard width and and depth of the plate. So easy to program that in. It's not going to be an issue, uh, and, and so. Uh, it, it would still continue to be an issue on TV a little bit, but uh, but you can see sometimes they do show the 3D models on TV and they'll they'll flip it around and it shows the plate and I see, oh, it caught the very front of the plate. And by the time it got even to the back of the plate, it was low, but it caught the very front. You see that ABS will handle all that just beautifully. Um, thank you, Greg, for the question. Love hearing from Greg. Love, love hearing from any of you on the text messages. Uh, again, I'll give you that contact info at the end of the episode so that you can uh, reach out to us that way. I've got just uh, one or two more questions from, from Twitter to go through when we come back. So uh, I will come back and do that in a second. I wanna thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. And please continue to keep it Locked On Dodgers. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Uh, BetterHelp, you know, life, life is hard sometimes. Life can be challenging. There's so much going on in our lives. And sometimes it's really hard to prioritize yourself. And one of the best ways that you can prioritize yourself is prioritizing your mental health and giving yourself uh, the opportunity to talk through things you need to talk through. Therapy can be a wonderful thing in your life that can help you, whether you need to figure out your priorities, how to uh, you know take care of yourself better, how to 
create boundaries, set boundaries with family or friends so that you can focus on you a little bit. Or even if you're going through something really hard, you know, therapy can be a wonderful thing. And it's so easy to get caught up in life that you forget to give yourself what you need. So uh, if you're thinking of starting therapy, you should give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. So if you are thinking about it, find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnMLB today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnMLB. All right, I am back. I want to thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. I also want to remind you again about the SXM app. If you are a Sirius XM subscriber, you probably have access to the SXM app. It's available with most of their plans, and you can listen to the Dodgers hometown broadcast live as the game is going on. If you can't catch it on TV or in person or whatever, just pull out the SXM app and search for Dodgers, and you can listen to the game that way. It's a great way to keep in, uh, keep track of your Dodgers while they're playing. I use it a lot. I listen to the Dodgers on Sirius XM a lot, whether it's in my car or on the app. There are just times when it's more convenient for me to listen than to watch, and SXM is a great way to do it. And, of course, you can also listen to this podcast on the SXM app. All you got to do is search for Locked On Dodgers. Uh, all right. Last, I think, one or two questions. Uh one one serious one and one uh, joking one, kind of. One from Eddie Carrillo at Eddie C underscore 89 on Twitter. He says, in how many games are the Dodgers going to win the World Series, four or five? And uh, I guess the answer is five, just because, you know, four seems arrogant to say right now on May 5th. Cinco de Mayo. Happy Cinco de Mayo, guys. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll go with five games. Why not? Um, depends on who they're playing, you know. Uh, hopefully the Dodgers have home field advantage. Uh, but if they, ooh, if they are on the road, that would be fun to win it in four or five games. Cause then they can win it at home. If they have home field advantage, I, I would kind of hope for a six game one just so they could win it at home. But I, honestly winning the world series is the most important thing. Uh, you know, Eddie is obviously, uh, it's kind of a joking question, but it's also, I think this is a really good team. And that kind of segues into our next question from Eric, the dub at Eric, the dub two. He says, I'm still on the train to bring up all the young guys and get under the cap. Am I wrong for it? Or do we actually believe in this team? And Eric, I believe in this team. Uh, you know, they, they aren't as good as they've been in the past. The, the Dodgers are really good this year. Like they're on pace for 95 wins right now and they've underperformed so far. Uh, and so, you know, they, they do have a tougher schedule to come up. I think we're going to learn a lot about this team in the next month because, uh, May is going to be tougher than April was schedule wise, but they're in a better place team wise too. And so it, it's going to be interesting to see, but I really do think this team, they, they can absolutely make the postseason. I, I still expect them to win the division. I think they are the best team in the division. Uh, either way, they're going to make the postseason. And as we've seen so many times, it's about getting hot in the postseason. And the Dodgers definitely have the talent to get hot in the postseason and win this. And the other part of this question that uh, kind of, yeah, one of my favorite sayings is I reject the premise of the question. Uh, it's kind of this stupid, arrogant thing of mine. Um, but he said, Eric asked about bringing up the young guys and getting under the, the cap, the luxury tax. That's not going to happen. It can't happen because these guys are under contract. So bringing up young guys wouldn't do it. You'd have to, you know, if you trade, you know, who, who do you trade? You trade Chris Taylor, OK, at this point, you'd save, uh, you know, some of his salary. The Dodgers are so far over the, the luxury tax at this point. There's nothing realistic that they could do to get under, because even if they just released everybody who's getting paid a lot of money, uh, they still have to pay them. They would have to trade those guys. And, you know, uh, David Peralta, uh, are you going to trade him without eating that salary? Probably not. Chris Taylor, are you going to trade him without eating that salary? Probably not. And so there's no realistic path at this point for the Dodgers to get under the luxury tax. So I don't think that's even a, a blip on their thought process right now. I think that ship has come and gone. It has sailed. Uh, ship has sailed. Yeah, that's a, that's a saying. Um, the Dodgers aren't going to get under the luxury tax this year, and they're not considering getting under the luxury tax this year because it's not going to happen. 
So whether they call up the young guys or not will have to do with whether they think the young guys can help them win this year. You know, that's why they called up Gavin Stone because they want to see what he has. I think the Dodgers are recognizing that Noah Syndergaard doesn't have much, uh, much uh, upside left. I talked about that a week or two ago. The upside from Noah Syndergaard is gone. And that means that, you know, if he sticks in the rotation, it's because they don't have better options. I think they're going to actively look for better options, whether that's Gavin Stone or Bobby Miller or Ryan Pepio or Michael Grove. Uh, you know, at some point, unless Noah Syndergaard really surprises us, he's going to be out of the rotation and, you know, probably either traded or, or just released. Um, and, and again, he's a guy making some money. You're not going to trade him without eating some of the salary. So maybe they do find a way to trade him more likely they DFA him and release him, uh, at, at some point this season, unless he really makes a turnaround. That's kind of, that's the goal with this Dodgers team. The Dodgers are always in a win now situation and they've done a great job over the years of balancing. Let's win now. Let's also build a great farm system. And so, you know, any trades they make will be to improve this team this year. Any young guys they call up, it'll be to improve this team this year. And that's how it should be because this team definitely has potential. It's not the best team we've seen in the last uh, 10 years among the Dodgers, but it's it's a very good team and has just as good a chance of winning the World Series as any of those other teams. I think this team is as good as the 2017, 2017 team that would have won the World Series if not for the cheating cheaters. Uh, you know, they, this is a very good team. Uh, they, they need health. They need to come together, but it's a good team. That's my thoughts on that, Eric. I'd love to hear if you agree or disagree. And with that said, uh, I think that's going to do it for today's episode, and that will do it for this week. Uh, I do want to thank you guys so much for checking out Locked on Dodgers every weekday morning. It really does mean a lot to us. We love our everydayers. If you're not an everydayer, it's really easy to become one. You just watch or listen every day. Super easy, super fun. And, uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you if you are an everydayer. If you have friends or family who, lo who love the Dodgers like you do, please tell them about the show. There are, you know, we have a loyal fan base of this show, and we really appreciate that. We would love to double that fan base, if you know what I mean. So if you know people who love the Dodgers, uh, I'm going to shout out my friends again, Heather and Trevor. Uh, they got they got Heather's parents. Uh, uh, I, I remembered, I was reminded, uh, I shouted out Heather's parents on yesterday's episode. Heather's mom is named Sandy, like Sandy Koufax. That's pretty awesome. Uh, so, you know, they Heather's parents listened to the show because Heather and Trevor told them about the show. So if you have loved ones who love the Dodgers, please tell them about the show. Maybe they'll like it. Maybe don't point them to the yesterday's episode with the terrible audio quality. Maybe this one's better. Uh, but I did think the content yesterday was good. Uh, so, you know, we, we do our best to to bring you the Dodgers every weekday morning. It's a lot of fun. SXM, SiriusXM, and the SXM app do their best to bring you the Dodgers every time they're playing. All you got to do is pull out the SXM app and search for Dodgers, and you can listen to the hometown broadcast as the game is going on. It's a great way to follow the Dodgers if you can't watch at the time and if you're not sitting in the stadium. And if you uh, you can also listen to this podcast on that uh, SXM app simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. What else? You can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at Locked On Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at Vince Semperio. No, not Vince Semperio. That's his old handle. Remember, he's on Twitter at Vince Since ninety one. I am on Twitter at Snydog, and the DMs are open in all of those places. Our email address is LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com. And our phone number for voicemails or text messages, like Greg from Bartlett, Bartlett Illinois, sends us is 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you on Monday. <laughs>